All right, well, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Jay Scott. I'm co-executive director here at Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for what I believe is our 12th lecture in the series today. And we have a very good one today. Um, before we get started, I just want to set up some, some ground rules. If you have suggestions for other lecture topics or other speakers, you're going to get a survey in the chat window. Um, just fill out that survey. It only takes a minute and you can put suggestions for future topics or future speakers that that we will um, consider have adding to the series. If you have questions that you want our speaker today to answer, um, you can post those into the chat and at the conclusion of the lecture, we will have those answered. Um, coming up later this week on Thursday, we have another lecture. It's the Open Pediatric Brain Tumor Atlas Initiative, New Models and Accelerated Discovery and Translation. So that's Thursday at one. Um, but today, today we have a special guest uh, the name of the lecture is The Many Genomic Roads to Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia, presented by Charles Mulligan. Charles um, is a member of the Department of Pathology, co-leader of the Hematologic Malign Malignancies Program, and the Deputy Director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center, and, that wasn't enough, the Director of the Biorepository at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. Charles uh, gained his medical degree from University of Adelaide in Australia, um, then he undertook doctoral studies in immunogenetics at Oxford uh, and specialist training in hematology and hematopathology at the Institute of Medical and Veterinary Science in Adelaide. He joined St. Jude's as a postdoc in 2004 and then joined as faculty in 2008. Um, we want to welcome Charles. He's been a good friend to Alex's Lemonade, helps us out in a lot of ways, and really appreciate him coming and doing this lecture today. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Charles. Thank you, Jay, and thank you um, to the Foundation for your support and for asking me to give this lecture today. And um, in thinking about what to present today, I, I thought what I would like to try and do is to give a flavor for where we have come over the last few years in understanding the genetic basis of acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which is much of what my lab focuses on, to touch on a couple of examples that I think are illustrative as to why genomic analysis is so important of this, in this disease and to try and highlight um, at each turn how we are keeping a, a close eye on clinical translation and, and, and uh, implementation. So for those that may not be so familiar with this disease, ALL is the commonest childhood disease. Uh, most children are cured, but a substantial minority relapse and it's very difficult to cure once relapse occurs. And because of this um, phenomenon, leukemia remains, it's always been around the top two causes of childhood cancer death, and now it's second only to brain tumors uh, as cause of childhood cancer death. There is a real need for better therapeutic approaches. If you look at all the drugs that we use to treat um, ALL, most were developed many years ago, if not decades ago, and really apart from kinase inhibition and bcr able leukemia and the newer immunotherapeutic approaches, both CAR-T and antibody-based immunotherapy, there's really been very little that's truly targeted to genetic changes or specific vulnerabilities in this disease. Um, I'm not gonna go over um, every study in a whole lot of detail, but what I wanted to do to set the stage for today's talk is to show this as a summary and many groups over a decade have used various genomic approaches, starting with SNP arrays, moving right through to whole genome sequencing, to classify the disease and to understand the sequence of events that drive leukemogenesis and treatment response. And I, I summarize it this way. Um, most children have some level of predisposition, either from non-coding SNPs or from deleterious variants and genes that set them up to be predisposed to develop leukemia. Then typically there's a founding genetic change, more on those later, that initiates leukemogenesis, but then it requires um, additional, although a fairly small number of cooperating events to become a fully fledged leukemia. And in fact, that genetic um, parsimony, if you like, the small number of mutations has been to our benefit because it's allowed us to understand their role in transformation better than perhaps genetically more complex diseases. ALL, I think, has been a poster child as well for understanding uh, genomic evolution and relapse. And it's um, illustrated several themes that have been confirmed in many other cancers that most patients are uh, harboring a polyclonal disease at diagnosis, often with a predominant clone that's eliminated after therapy, allowing a minor clone to relapse when relapse does occur. So what does this mean? Well, we know that a couple of important points here is that many of the um, classifying lesions, the initial chromosomal lesions, 
uh, not only important for leukemiogenesis, but they're profoundly associated with outcome, both in children. And I show here actually a slide for adults because the results are even more striking that there is an enormously strong association between founding genetic alterations and the risk of treatment failure, and, and more on that in a moment. But another point that I think is very important is that for many years, we thought for a long time mostly about somatic, that is acquired genetic events, causing cell intrinsic resistance to therapy. And we now know the determinants of response or treatment failure are more complex, that germline variants can have a role in dictating treatment response as well as predisposing to leukemia. And that when there is resistance to therapy, it can be from cell extrinsic features, for example, interaction of tumor cells with their microenvironment. And I'll, I'll give some examples of this during the talk. So now to go back some years back really to, to the early 2000s when I first started working in the field and we were starting to use early genomic approaches to understand leukemia, there were really relatively few genetic markers that classified childhood ALL and were used to prognosticate. And that was typically aneuploidy, uh, hyper and hypodiploidy, as well as a small number of rearrangements such as telam one MLL rearrangement and so forth uh, that are present at variable frequency. But what's striking here that you can see is that many children and more adults didn't have one of these alterations. So it's been known for some time that the genomic landscape is more complex than just these few alterations uh, defined. What was also known was that if um, one looks at gene expression profiling, uh, and this holds true today, but the early studies were from microarray analysis, these founding alterations were associated very strongly with the leukemic transcriptome. So although we now know there's much more to leukemia genomics than just these few chromosomal alterations, it is known that these alterations are likely founding initiating events because of their very strong association with the final leukemic cell gene expression profile, and that holds true today. So over the last few years, there have been many genomic studies performed at various scale and resolution and technical approaches by many groups, including the Pediatric Cancer Genome Project between St. Jude and Washington University, the uh, NCI COG Target Initiative, which is like a pediatric equivalent of the TCGA Genome Project, and a number of other studies as well. And in terms of classifying the disease, it's really been uh, transcriptome sequencing that has really lifted a veil on what we understand about the, uh, the different subtypes of leukemia. The first study was, first studies were really defining this subtype called pH-like leukemia that I'll come back to in a moment, but as well as a number of other alterations that studies started to chip away at the unknown edifice, if you like, and started to identify rearrangements of transcription factor genes, DUX4, MF2D and others, and starting to suggest that these might be defining uh, new subtypes of leukemia. So what I show on this slide is a, actually an ongoing project, the first results of which were published last year, but this is a study that now encompasses over 3,000 patients with ALL. Uh, but at the time, we published this study just based on RNA sequencing being present in all individuals. So this is almost 2,000 cases. And this is showing a, a, um, a TISNI plot, uh, approach that's often used for single cell profiling, but this is looking at gene expression where each dot represents an individual case. Um, and one can see the different subtypes of leukemia by their color. And so we see well-known subtypes here that I've mentioned before, such as MLL rearrangement, hyperdiploidy, and so forth, as well as a number of other subtypes. Um, and some of these are really very clear, and I'll come back to a couple of these during the talk as to why they're so important. So subtypes here defined by rearrangements of transcription factor genes, um, other subtypes that are less common, but with enough cases, we're starting to identify new subtypes with good risk, such as rearrangements of NUTM1 or very poor risk with rearrangement of BCL2 and MIG. And then some additional observations. So we now see that uh, groups can be defined by point mutations, um, such as this mutation in PAX5, or heterogeneous alterations targeting one gene, such as this group that's been called PAX5 alt. Um, there are other, we're seeing more and more of these instances with more cases where we see point mutations defining um, subtypes of disease, indicating they have a unique role in transformation. And then there's this um, very common subtype um, called the kinase-driven leukemia, so driven by BCR-ABLE or its phenocopies, pH-like leukemia. 
So why, why do we not identify these cases before? Well, often it was because of the limited resolution of conventional genetic analysis, so cytogenetics, or because of some of the reasons that I've mentioned already that some of the alterations that define subtypes are not uh, amenable to cytogenetic analysis because they're point mutations, for example. Or they're heterogeneous, and this we see more and more. And so this is perhaps the first clinically relevant point I would make that many of these subtypes of leukemia aren't just a single alteration or a single fusion that drives leukemia, but for example, in this case here, multiple fusions that converge on a single gene, but all of these cases essentially behave the same way. So this is just one example. This is a group called MEF2D rearranged leukemia where um, a myocyte transcription factor gene MEF2D is fused to a number of other targets as shown here. Um, you know, without belaboring the detail here, I, you know, these are, these are transforming fusions uh, in vitro and in vivo. Um, they, this is a nice example where it does create a therapeutic opportunity, not because of a straightforward um, precision medicine, if you like, approach where you're matching a, a drug to a, a known mutation, but here because of the gene expression deregulation that's induced by the fusion. In this case here, these fusions activate expression of a gene called histone deacetylase 9 or HDAC9 as shown here, um, and these uh, leukemias are very sensitive to HTAC inhibitors. So these are xenografts as shown here, and the, uh, the purple line or the pink line in particular shows striking data for panabinostat, an HTAC inhibitor, which is exceedingly active in these leukemias. A very important point is that um, the subtypes of leukemia that we're identifying now are not just because of um, multiple fusions, as I've just shown you, converging on a single gene, but we're increasingly seeing this phenomenon of phenocopies where uh, alternative genetic alterations are simulating a founding alteration that's been well recognized. So I've mentioned one of these already, um, pH-like leukemia, where we see lesions simulating pH-positive disease. Another striking example is this one, um, etv 6 rungs one like leukemia, where we can see these cases uh, color-coded in non-yellow colors uh, clustering with the etv 6 ETV6 runs one rearranged leukemias. And this phenomenon of phenocopying is really seen across the landscape of ALL at variable prevalence. So in some subtypes, it's relatively uncommon. For example, PBX1 rearranged leukemia doesn't tend to have phenocopying cases. In others, the, the phenocopies outnumber the canonical forms, such as in pH-like leukemia. But usually the phenocopies make sense. This is true in pH-like leukemia, where you see all these other kinase alterations, and it's very true in ETV6 runs one um, rearranged leukemia, where we see a number of other rearrangements, either with ETV6 itself or with other members of the ETS family of transcription factors, or indeed other transcription factor, factor genes, such as Icaros itself, um, that converge on the same transcriptional outputs. Um, and mediate the formation of leukemias that otherwise look clinically very similar to the founding subtype. So another reason why um, genomic approaches are needed to better manage uh, patients with ALL. I mentioned uh, already this notion that point mutations can drive leukemogenesis, and I just show one example of this. So we see several examples now where um, specific point mutations appear to be uh, mediating a unique mechanism of transformation. And, and one of these that I'll focus on now is PAX5 or paired box 5, which is by no means a new target of genetic alteration in ALL. Indeed, back in uh, the late 2000s, in one of the first studies published about leukemia genomics, the focus really was identifying these diverse genetic alterations of PAX5, such as rearrangements of the gene, um, sequence mutations, or a number of deletions that typically deleted part of the gene. And at, at that time, uh, we typically considered that these alterations of PAX5, which encodes a, uh, a B cell transcription factor gene, to be very important events, but usually secondary events. They were uh, seen uh, in the context of other subtypes or other fusions, such as telamma one for example. There were exceptions, of course, such as the fusions, but they are fairly uncommon. Well, now, again, we appreciate with large numbers of cases that specific mutations can have specific effects. So if you look at this protein domain plot of PAX5, the lesions above the domain plot are this subtype of PADR-driven leukemia, and the mutations below the plot are the other um, lesions that are seen across the, the spectrum of ALL. Um, and you can see that all of these cases have this alteration of PADR. 
uh, and a few of them have a secondary mutation that's typically uh, loss of function, such as a frame shift mutation. But it is, it is notable that it's this single mutation that appears to be mediating these, uh, this distinct form of leukemia. There are many other highly deleterious mutations that we see in the DNA binding domain, colored yellow here, that are seen across the landscape of leukemia, but this one mutation um, has this leukemia initiating effect. Um, again, it's, it's been a nice model to study because the number of genetic alterations is relatively small and it allows us to then turn to the mouse to model it. So for example, here, the Onca print shows that we have these uh, point mutations of PAX5, but then every case acquires a second hit in the remaining copy of PAX5, typically a deletion that removes the second copy or less frequently a loss of function sequence mutation. And then Virtually all cases have a signaling pathway alteration, um, particularly the RAS pathway, which is a little bit unusual for ALO having such a high frequency in a subtype, but, and also other members of the uh, JAK-STAT signaling pathway. So this all seems logical, but at the time when we first observed this, there was really no precedent for a sequence mutation being a leukemia initiating driver of ALL, and we sought to formally model that um, and we had been starting to use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology to make uh, germline knock-ins of various point mutations seen in ALL. And an example of this is shown here, where we knocked in the PADR mutation. We also knocked in the G183S mutation. And I'll mention a little later, this is a mutation that's seen in familial uh, BALL. Um, and the results are very striking. Um, there are very few models of robustly penetrant BALL in the mouse. And this was very penetrant. So heterozygotes for the PADR mutation developed leukemia in about six months and homozygosity halved that time. And the leukemia has behaved um, at all levels really homologously to human leukemia. They had a similar immunophenotype. When we turned to genomics, we found that they did very similar things to the human tumors. For example, the data on the bottom right show that these tumors start with a single copy mutation of PAX5, but they then delete the wild type um, allele, either the whole gene or a single exon in the middle case, or even uh, amplify the locus increasing its oncogenicity. So providing proof of principle that these lesions are truly leukemia initiating. So they're just a couple of examples. And for reasons of time, I wanted to not kind of march through every subtype of leukemia, although each is interesting in its own way, um, but to really touch on those as a couple of themes and then move on. But before doing so, I wanted to just kind of stop here and take stock and show where we are with a, uh, if you like, a transcriptomic classification of leukemia. Um, now, both in my research lab and also in the clinical lab at St. Jude, we use multiple approaches at the same time to now classify BALL using gene expression profiling plus fusion calling plus aneuploidy calling and targeted interrogation of sequence mutations. And by doing so, we can classify the disease into a little over 20 subtypes. And one can see there's, there's marked heterogeneity um, according to age. So if we look here in children, um, almost 40% of them have good risk lesions such as teloma one and hyperdiploidy. And we can see with increasing age, there's a marked increase in the prevalence of um, kinase-driven leukemia, as well as some other subtypes that are also associated with adverse outcome. So, and this, this has been a, a long story for many groups over a long period of time, but this is also important because it had been recognized for a long period of time that there was a, if you like, a precipitous uh, fall off in outcomes of ALL with increasing age, particularly in that adolescent young adult population and it really wasn't clear how much of that was driven by tumor biology or genetics and how much of it may have been through perhaps, you know, regimen or compliance-based issues. And whilst those are obviously important, one can see from this graph here that much of the poor outcome of ALL is driven by, uh, in older individuals, driven by founding lesion. This re-shows some of the data I was showing you before that we now have more subtypes that are associated with favorable outcome, DUX4 and the PADR subtype, as I mentioned before, associated with relatively favorable outcome. But we clearly have more subtypes now, in addition to some of the previously credentialed ones, that are associated with very poor outcome. And so we can number among those, not just the kinase-driven leukemias, but the BCL2 mic group, hypodiploidy, um, as well as others.
So I've, I've mentioned pH like leukemia a couple of times, and this is in some ways um, an old story that continues to become new again. And so much of these data are published, and I didn't want to just go over old data, but I wanted to, uh, to show this because it remains clinically really important. And I wanted to show a couple of aspects about um, how we're thinking about treating pH like leukemia and where we're taking this in future. So again, this is work of many groups over a long period of time, but pH like ALL really is the greatest unmet need in B lineage leukemia because of its commonality and because of its poor treatment outcomes in many cases. It really does drive the poor treatment outcomes in many older individuals with ALL, particularly adolescents and younger adults. It kind of rises in prevalence to exceed 20% across the age spectrum. Um, and it's astonishingly genetically diverse. You can see now uh, various alterations here just showing rearrangements and fusions, but alterations targeting uh, over 16 different cytokine receptors and tyrosine kinases to many, many different partner genes. So of course here, I've restated again, another example why one needs optimally sequencing to better accurately uh, diagnose and classify leukemia. Now, despite the diversity, one can distill it down into several logical pathways. So the commonest group is this JAK stat driven group, which is also uh, the poorest outcome um, and the most complex. Uh, Many of the cases of pH-like leukemia are driven by rearrangements that activate this gene CRLF2, cytokine receptor like factor two through enhancer hijacking to the IGH locus or other strong enhancers, um, as well as a number of other lesions such as point mutations in the IL-7 receptor, uh, truncating rearrangements of the, of the EPO receptor, as well as more conventional fusions of Janus kinase genes. Um, and then these other subtypes, there's an ABLE class group that do respond generally, at least in preclinical models and now in case reports, uh, quite well to drugs like desatinib and imatinib, and a number of other less common but important alterations in genes like FLT3 and TRAC3 and so forth. And a lot of preclinical data, and now more data from, um, from you know, data from in-man, from case reports, is showing that um, these alterations do activate their logical signaling pathways as well as parallel signaling pathways such as you know, PI3K, mTOR, as well as activating pathways that are amenable to therapeutic inhibition such as BCL2 and MCL1 inhibition. So do they respond? So here's, um, here's one example where they do respond beautifully. So these are not that common, but they're a recurrent lesion. And these are uh, ETV6 and TRAC3 rearrangements that are highly uh, potently transforming as a single oncogene. In ALL, uh, cells are exquisitely sensitive to track inhibitors such as larotrectinib or on the right, a plexicon agent that also inhibits CS a CSF1 receptor. Um, and if we treat xenografts, we can essentially suppress even abolish tumor growth. So if we, uh, this shows here, if we treat for a month, the tumors come back, but then they re-respond, they don't acquire resistance. And indeed, if we treat for long enough, we can abolish the tumor completely. So that's quite a, a remarkable and exceptional example, really in BALL at all, where monotherapy with a TKI can essentially eradicate disease. And there's now good data from a number of series and case reports that patients are also showing very good responses to larotrectinib that when they have ETV6 and TRAC3 rearranged ALL. Now, the, the yang of this unit, if you like, is the bigger problem, which is CRLF2 deregulation. So I've mentioned a couple of aspects of this before. This is a, a, a cytokine receptor that's not normally expressed in B cells. It's uh, rearranged either through uh, an IGH enhanced hijacking event or a focal deletion upstream of the gene that brings it uh, in approximation to upstream promoters. Um, it's often seen with concomitant Janus kinase point mutations that are co-transforming um, and it activates these downstream signaling pathways that um, are druggable, uh, we believe, with, um, for example, Janus kinase inhibitors such as uh, ruxolitinib as well as a number of other um, targeted approaches as well. Now, the, the problem here is that these leukemias do not respond as well to monotherapy with a logical kinase inhibitor, that is ruxolitinib. So yes, they activate JAK-STAT signaling typically. Um, if we look at other um, JAK-STAT driven pH-like leukemias with fusions such as with JAK-2, we see pretty good responses, particularly if you combine with chemotherapy. But work that was done by Dave Tichy and Sarah Tazian and others at CHOP some years ago showed that the response to TKIs to serial to rearranged leukemia is difficult to predict based on genomics and is often pretty miserable with uh, limited or even no responses. Some do respond, but certainly some don't. 
And a number of reasons have been proposed for this, that um, the inhibitors actually lock JAK2 into a phosphorylated state that can activate signaling around activated JAK2 through JAK1 and other molecules and lead to unconstrained kinase signaling downstream and transformation. So with that, um, you may be aware of the, the recent vogue for protein degradation with Protax or proteolysis targeting chimeras. Uh, we started thinking at St. Jude about how we could use targeted protein degradation to tackle key targets in ALL, and we thought this might be a useful context to use Protax-based approaches. And to summarize some of the advantages of this, um, and the, the, uh, the pharmacokinetic properties that these are different from kind of on off um, occupancy driven uh, traditional drugs um, that have often a requirement for high exposure and uh, limited duration of activity and off target effects. Protax are looking to degrade a specific target of interest by coupling a, um, a um, ligandable domain engaging target with a molecule that engages an E3 ubiquitin ligase and then targets the protein of interest for ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation. And this, of course, has attracted a great deal of interest because of its potential uh, not just to target kinases, and many kinases have been shown to be successfully drugged uh, with Protax, but also to go after undruggable targets, for example, um, zinc finger containing uh, transcription factors. So we've worked with a team of, uh, of chemists, structural biologists, as well as leukemia biologists in my lab at St. Jude to, to use this approach. Um, again, with the premise here of developing a series of molecules that bring together um, a modification of a kinase inhibitor that's targeting Janus kinases to um, E3 ligases such as Cerebron to target them for degradation. We've used, most of the development has been based on ruxolitinib and also baricitinib and other um, uh, TKI coupled to the imids, uh, particularly lenalidomide and pomalidomide, um, based on initially the, there was actually no structure of um, one of the kinase inhibitors such as ruxolitinib bound to JAK2, so we used a, an existing model, but since that time we've actually solved the structure of, of um, ruxolitinib and baricitinib bound to JAK2. Uh, we've made a series of compounds and shown that some of these are quite strikingly potent. This shows some of the, the structural biology data. This on the right here shows uh, ruxolitinib bound to the, um, the, the active site of, of JAK2, the kinase domain, uh, with the region that we predicted was going to be exposed to solvent and thereby amenable to modification by adding a linker to, to make a protac. Um, and this is shown here. And so that they were the structures that we developed to then um, to engineer the various series of protacs. And so a lot of data, but just to show a couple of the high points here, um, we've identified several series of agents. We've started to establish the, the rules for, for the linker, et cetera, and the modifications that can be made by a great deal of trial and error, and have found that, um, for example, shown on the top left here, this is a prototypical cell line for serial F2 rearranged leukemia. The founding TKI RUX and the founding IMID pomalidomide are relatively inactive, but we can achieve a greater than 70,000 fold increased potency by coupling them into one, one or more of these protacs. Um, we've actually achieved greater specificity. So this is kinome scan data showing the activity of RUX on the left. And we achieve much greater specificity with these agents as shown um, on the right. Um, there are still some unexplained aspects of why some of these agents are active or not in various cell lines, but we've tested an increasing panel of cell lines that are representative of various types of leukemia, JAK stat driven and not. But a couple of key points are that we can achieve sub, sub nanomolar EC50 um, in our key serial F2 rearranged cell lines, typically with sparing of non kinase driven leukemias. Um, and we've also shown that it is indeed dependent on this protect mechanism because when we knock out cerebellum, the drugs are no longer active. We can achieve um, a degradation of JAK2 and we can achieve killing of cells uh, in xenograft models in contrast to killing of cells with the conventional type 1 and type 2 JAK inhibitors. It should be noted this is not all JAK dependent. In fact, um, we've kind of fenic, we've recapitulated prior data from genetic models where you know JAK2 mutations are very important in transforming the cells to a leukemic state, but an activation of JAK2 alone is not sufficient. If we use Protax that are solely and potently JAK2 degraders, we only have partial efficacy. One requires 
in activation of other targets that Protax commonly go after, such as GSPT1. But this has been um, a very promising and instructive approach about a new way of targeting these high-risk leukemias. So there, um, I want to pause for a breath, literally and figuratively, um, and move, move away from kinase-driven leukemia and touch on a couple of other themes that I think are very important. And one of these is more kind of speaking as a pathologist um, by training initially, where in leukemia, we've, we've, we've always been trained to start with the conventional approaches and then move into the genetic or the molecular or the genomic. So that is we... We look at morphology, we then classify by immunophenotype into AML or ALL, we then say it's B cell or T cell, and then we start thinking about genetics. Well, you know, it's been known for a long time that that's, that often doesn't work. So there are leukemias where there are lymphoid and myeloid features, for example, mixed phenotype leukemia or early T cell precursor leukemia, which has T cell features, but also stem cell features. And now we're seeing more and more of these examples, not only where this conventional way of thinking breaks down, but also we can find explanations as to why, or we can find genetic events that transcend this classification and show that really genomics should be used as the classifying basis. So with that kind of, kind of preamble aside, here's the first example. And so this is ZNF384 rearranged leukemia. So again, we're coming back to the TISNI plot purely of BLL, as I was showing before. So all of these cases were diagnosed as meeting the immunophenotypic criteria for B lineage leukemia, but we can see this group here, most of which, not quite all, it's another case where we see phenocopies, but most of these cases have this rearrangement of the zinc finger transcription factor gene called ZNF384. Um, now why I'm showing this is because this is an example where other leukemias have these fusions and the, the genomics are very important. And I mentioned a couple of these before. We became very interested in the field of early T-cell precursor leukemia in the late 2000s, and we, we described some genetic features of that. And then over the last few years, we were looking at a related form of leukemia called mixed phenotype acute leukemia, where there are typically um, myeloid features plus B or T-cell features. So for example, myeloperoxidase plus CD3, the T-cell marker, or myeloperoxidase and CD19, the, um, the B-cell marker. And often with this additional level of complexity where you can see either a truly biphenotypic leukemia where um, uh, you have a single population of cells expressing multiple lineage markers, or you have this more complex picture where it's a bilineal or a multilineal leukemia, even a quadrilineal leukemia, where you see two, three, or four um, sets of markers within the same patient. And really the questions were, why do we see this? What are the lesions? Why do you see this clonal heterogeneity? And I'll come to these questions in a moment. So the first observation was this one, where if we look at these cases here, these uh, cases that have um, B myeloid features, more than half of them have exactly the same fusions of this gene ZNF34 as we'd seen in the BLL cases that I was showing you before. Same, same fusion ochroprotein, same genes, same partner genes, which are interesting, but I won't go into those today. Um, same co-lesions, same, same secondary targets of alteration between the cases that were diagnosed as BLL or B myeloid leukemia. Same transcriptomic output. So another another TISNI plot here where these are the, um, the cases that are xenia 3D4 rearranged and regardless of whether they're diagnosed as MPAL or BALL, they look the same in gene expression space. So this, this first blush, if you like, strongly suggested that um, this is a leukemia that's aberrant. Some cases are more aberrant than others. If they're more aberrant, they express MPO at the protein level and they're classified as mixed phenotype. Other cases are more, con more consistent with a conventional BALL, but the genomic lesion is paramount. The question, I guess, is why do they have this ambiguity in contrast to a more conventional form of BALL? Why do they have this picture where we see multiple subpopulations in a single case? Well, it's not from genetic variegation because we formally address this by flow sorting the subpopulations in many of these cases and sequencing each subpopulation individually and found that the co-lesions are basically expressed in all the subpopulations. So it wasn't as we might have hypothesized that 
a myeloid population might have got a FLT3 mutation or a T cell population may have gotten a notch mutation. It seemed that the same genetic lesions were present um, in all the subpopulations. In contrast, the, this lineage plasticity is intrinsic to the leukemia and there are several observations that support this uh, experimentally and also from patients. And so the, some of the experimental data is shown here where if we do the same experiment, we flow sort the populations and then put them into mice, they then go on and recapitulate the full uh, variegation of the primary tumor. Um, you put in the T cell population, you get the entire lineage bandwidth out. So there's, the cells retain this ability to cross differentiate into several lineages. Um, by genomics, we were seeing the same thing. If we take the human hematopoietic hierarchy from primary patient cells, so not from a normal sample, but these are the primary leukemias, the kind of 90 to 95% tumor, but we then go back and sort out what are presumptive normal subpopulations in these leukemias and genotype them, we can find that the, the lesions, the founding lesions, the, the, the fusions or other point mutations are seen in a subset of HSC. So it appears to be a combination of seed and soil. So not a new concept, but it appears to be particularly true here where if the right lesion is acquired in a progenitor that's immature enough, you will drive this lineage uh, ambiguous leukemia. And this is consistent with what we see in patients over time. You can often see, for example, ETP ALL patients relapsing as mixed phenotype or AML or a mixed phenotype relapsing as BALL. Um, this is supported by data from formal uh, modeling data now from mice. So we've used a couple of different approaches to introduce some of these key uh, alterations in mouse models. So these are conditional knock-in models for one of the commonest fusions, uh, EP300, ZNF384 or ZFP384 as it's known in the mouse, uh, crossed with Vavcre. And we see this perturbed um, hematopoietic development where we see gross skewing of the number of B cells and myeloid cells, and we start to actually see lineage ambiguous populations that are aberrant emerging in the mouse bone marrow. So providing additional supportive data that these lesions directly perturb hematopoiesis. The same in human cells, um, a difficult experiment done by a grad student, Kirsten Dickinson in my lab shown that um, if you uh, introduce um, these fusions into uh, flow sorted colonies from human CD34 positive cord blood, you also induce the outgrowth of colonies that are abnormal and lineage ambiguous. Um, and the same thing in mice, if we transplant the cells into mice, we can uh, engineer leukemias that are also lineage ambiguous. So why is this clinically important? Well, this is another example where there, there may also be therapeutic approaches that are not perhaps initially intuitive. So one of them is shown here. If you look at the gene expression profile, these leukemias actually have very high level expression of FLT3. And if, if you look right across the landscape of ALLs, you find that these leukemias actually have some of the highest level FLT3 expression of any leukemia, including uh, MLL rearranged leukemia um, as shown up here. And in fact, patient data um, came out first. So this was a patient reported by Tim Lay and his group at WashU, where they diagnosed um, his patient, Lucas Wartman, who's now a physician with EP300 rearranged leukemia. Um, it wasn't recognized to be part of this subtype at the time that those observations came later, but they also found that his leukemia had very high level expression of FLT3 and showed a dramatic response to sunitinib. So an, an example of where there is a non-mutational um, vulnerability here from high FLT3 level expression that could potentially be targeted with uh, FLT3 inhibitors. Okay, so um, in the last part of the talk, maybe the last 10 minutes, I'm trying to leave some time for questions. I wanted to talk about one other, one other paradigm, if you like, of treatment failure. And so um, most of what I've spoken about today is really the somatic initiating genetic events, be they fusions or point mutations. But as I mentioned before, we now consider there are other uh, ways to induce leukemia and to induce drug resistance, some of them being germline and some of them being uh, secondary and uh, ways in which they might potentially modulate drug response by influencing interaction with the microenvironment. And so the example I showed today is another story that's become new again. Um, the first data we published in this area of ICAROS or IKZF1 alterations in leukemia was published many years ago where we showed that um, this transcription factor gene, which is needed for the development of all lymphoid cells, 
uh, was very commonly mutated in the lymphoid form of PH positive or BCR able positive leukemia. So when it was ALL or CML transitioning to lymphoid blast crisis. Uh, we and others have spent a lot of time understanding some of the aspects of biology of Icaros. Um, there are various lesions, a bit like Pax5 I was showing before. There are many deletions of the gene. In particular, there's a, an internal deletion that removes the DNA binding domain of the gene, but leaves a dominant negative um, isoform called IK6 behind that can act as a competitive inhibitor of wild type Icaros. There are a number of somatic point mutations as shown here that also uh, affect the gene by impairing DNA binding and act as dominant negatives. And part of this phenotype is shown here. So these are mouse pre-B cells where we're showing immunofluorescence staining for Icaros. And this shows the normal punctate staining of Icaros to heterochromatin where it represses gene, gene transcription. And many of these mutants have these quite striking and distinctive and individual patterns of cellular mislocalization where they're sequestering wild type Icaros away from its normal sites of binding. We know that they contribute to leukemogenesis. If we, um, if we mod a model of CML uh, where BCR able is introduced here to co-model Icaros alterations as well as deletions of the inc 4 af tumor suppressor locus, which is commonly seen in pH positive leukemia, we see that these lesions together shift a myeloid phenotype to lymphoid phenotype consistent with the human genomics. And they also drive a very treatment resistant disease here, resistant to the TKI dasatinib, quite independent of inhibition of its target ABLE. It still shuts down ABLE signaling, but the leukemia has become uh, very resistant to any therapy. And studies over a long period of time have shown part of the mechanism for this. And part of it is because when you mutate Icaros, um, you derepress expression of a number of adhesion molecules as shown this, you drive this very adhesive phenotype and the mutant cells can then stick to each other. They stick to the vasculature, they migrate into the bone marrow microenvironment and they, they're mislocalized and they become highly resistant. They adopt this very stem cell-like phenotype with enrichment for stem cell gene sets uh, and they become more uh, self-renewing, more immortal over time. So we see this interaction between Icaros perturbation, stemness, self-renewal, and this adhesive phenotype. This model is shown here, so normally Icaros is promoting differentiation, but when one mutates it, we de-differentiate de the cell and it becomes very adhesive. So the reason for showing this is this new story now, which is we've been seeing over and over again, where we see these somatic targets of mutation being seen as leukemia initiating events in the germline. And Another theme of this is that often the first indications of this are seen from families with leukemia, which are quite rare, but they can be very instructive. They can implicate a gene. And then once we go back and look at sporadic cohorts of leukemia, we can find proportions of sporadic non-familial leukemia also harboring genetic changes in the germline as well. So this was a family diagnosed by Rupert Hangrettinger uh, in Tübingen, Germany, a child that was diagnosed with BALL. They sequenced Icaros because many groups do this now as it's a poor prognostic marker. And they found a, a germline mutation of Icaros here that truncated uh, one of the DNA binding zinc fingers and then found it was present um, in, a, in an uncle that's had um, a pH positive leukemia and several relatives. Um, so the child's mother, siblings, um, and a, a niece. Many of, um, and a, concurrent with this, there have been a couple of papers, including the seminal one, showing that there were germline Icaros mutations in patients with antibody deficiency with common variable immunodeficiency. And so germline Icaros mutations have emerged as this uh, unifying genetic event, if you like, defining a subset of, of individuals that are prone to immunodeficiency, as well as uh, tumor susceptibility, particularly ALL. And that appeared, both of these appear to be present in this family when we went back and looked at some of the uh, patients who didn't have leukemia, they had evidence of immunodeficiency as well. So this, these are other examples where we're seeing these often very distinctive associations between, um, again, genes that are, are somatically mutated, but also present as germline events in familial leukemia. So one of the first of these was P53 in low hypodiploid leukemia. Uh, I mentioned one of the Pax5 mutations, G183S, that's seen in dicentric ALL, pretty uncommon, but very striking. And perhaps the most common target of these mutations in um, ETV6, 
which are not exclusively associated with hyperdiploid leukemia, but they show some level of enrichment. And very nice work from Jun Yang, um, Jorge de Paula and others had shown that sporadic cases of, um, of leukemia have a quite striking frequency of germline uh, alterations of ETV6. So again, the point being that one doesn't necessarily have to have a clear family history of leukemia to have evidence of germline predisposition to ALL. So that's true for ICROS. This was a collaborative study with Jun Yang and with Kim Nichols and others at St. Jude where um, this family was identified. Jun had been sequencing a number of genes, including ICROS in very large cohorts of ALL. And after analysis and filtering found that about 1% of ALL cases have one of these germline mutations of ICROS. And in distribution, they look really different from the somatic event. So rather than the, um, the enrichment in the DNA binding zinc fingers as shown here and the C-terminal transactivation domain here, we see many of these variants in regions that are less well understood. Um, some of them actually relatively common, suggesting there might just be STIPs that aren't particularly common. So over some time, we, we perform very standard assays of transcription factor function, as well as some of the more uh, detailed phenotypic assays to try and rigorously address the question of what is the relationship between these germline variants and alteration in transcription factor function and leukemogenesis and perhaps also drug response. And a couple of key messages from this are, well, virtually all of the variants were deleterious apart from um, a minority. Um, 10 of them we took into a huge battery of tests. But a key point here is that particularly for transcription factor, if we just look at one of the most standard assays, which is transcriptional activation, or in this case, transcriptional repression, because Icaros is a transcriptional repressor, we can miss the boat completely. So here are luciferase reporter assays for two targets of Icaros, MCL1 and Phi1. Wild type is suppressing activation. This somatic deletion isoform IK6 derepresses uh, expression. But then virtually all of the alterations, certainly all of the missense mutations do nothing. Um, they act just like wild type. The exceptions being these mutations that are either right in the DNA binding domain or they're truncating frame shift mutations. But if we'd stopped here, we would have just said, well, most of these variants do nothing. But they do do something. So they, to greater or lesser extent, cause this gross cellular mislocalization that I was showing you before. We show this by viral transduction approaches as well as by using genome editing to knock in several of the mutations. We see the same thing in the relatives of the proband of the family. So these sisters, if you like, are primed to develop leukemia should they uh, acquire a, um, an alteration such as BCR able that in other cases is leukemia initiating. And in fact, if we go back and look at the adhesion assay that I showed on the slide before, um, many of these germline variants are in fact the most deleterious of any across variants that we've studied before. So um, this is shown here where we are quantitating the numbers of these aggregates. We're also quantitating their size where um, this shows some of these germline variants in these uncharacterized domains um, that are much more deleterious in causing these phenotypes than any of the somatic variants we see in ALL. The same thing is seen in vivo. This is a, um, a, a kind of static transplant assay where we engineer leukemia, we transplant it and several days later we harvest the bones of mice and we image them. We can now do this in vivo, but this is showing um, the mis both the mislocalization of ICROS as well as this abnormal morphology and spindle shape uh, appearance of these cells. So again, this is clinically important because we know that somatic variants of ICROS, um, such as the deletion I referred to before, uh, is highly associated with treatment resistance in models, both in vitro as well as in vivo. And we see the same thing from many of these germline variants, even more so that they are inducing uh, drug agnostic and highly uh, profound resistance to chemotherapy, whether it's conventional chemotherapy or TKI therapy with desatinib. So how might this be circumvented? Well, one approach um, yet to be tested in trials, but we hope to get there is FAC inhibition. This is focal adhesion kinase in inhibitors. And the reason for testing these agents is that this, um, this, uh, this adhesion of, of ICROS mutant cells is partly mediated by aberrant expression of integrins. And when they become active, they signal through the FAC pathway that then activates downstream signaling uh, pathway activation as well as changes in cell morphology and FAC inhibition is extremely potent in 
uh, acting with dosatinib to reverse drug inhibition. And also, as you can see here from in vivo imaging at reversing the abnormal um, mislocalization of these cells uh, in, in mice transplanted with Icarus mutant leukemia. So there I, I wanted to stop. I wanted to leave a few minutes for questions, but just before doing so, I wanted to mention um, how we're using um, genomics to, to influence our treatment approach in ALL. And so this is now not new. This has been ongoing for some years. We are about halfway through the current study of frontline ALL therapy at St. Jude, which is Total Therapy 17. It's also opened at multiple sites uh, nationally and internationally where all patients with leukemia are, di are sequenced at diagnosis with whole genome and transcriptome sequencing. And that information is increasingly widely used to drive a number of um, variations in treatment approach, whether it's MRD monitoring, whether it's uh, the addition of TKR or other novel therapies, preemptive administration of immunotherapy and so forth. We have a lot to do. So if we think about uh, the classification of ALL, this has changed enormously now. If we go back to one of the earlier slides I showed you, there were relatively few um, novel approaches, you know, the exception being kinase inhibition and pH-like leukemia, but there are now a number of treatment contexts where we can consider both uh, alteration of intensity of therapy, not just in kids, but perhaps even in adults, if when they have very good risk subtypes, as well as a number of, of truly targeted approaches, as well as um, pathway-directed approaches or some of the uh, more unexpected uh, new treatment approaches, as I was mentioning before. Um, I finish on just coming back to how, how useful we think RNA sequencing is. Obviously, very few places are doing diagnostic whole genome sequencing for various reasons, but RNA sequencing, even despite the genetic diversity of ALL, is really extremely informative in giving us perhaps not everything we need to know about the leukemia genome, but virtually everything we need to classify the disease up front and make informed uh, treatment decisions in terms of novel therapeutic approaches. A couple of reasons for this are shown here. So we can make a clinical grade um, classifier, a TISNI plot here. This is one example uh, of this with a couple of different um, uh, cases. So this is a case here that fell clearly in the ETV6 RUNX1 group that actually did have the ETV6 RUNX1 rearrangement, but it was initially missed because it's often expressed at really low level, but then this case was rescued. This is at the opposite end of the risk spectrum. This is a case that falls in the MLL rearranged group, high risk leukemia, but MLL rearrangement negative, but had a Hox gene rearrangement that was leading to the same uh, leukemia behavior and uh, the same kind of risk features that we see for MLL rearranged leukemia. Aneuploid is, is important and we've developed a clinical grade pipeline where we can robustly call aneuploidy hyper and hypodiploidy, correct for the various ploidy correction artifacts that have kind of bedeviled this approach. So even if one doesn't have cytogenetic carrier typing at all, we can robustly call aneuploidy. Sometimes it can even outperform cytogenetics by correcting chromosomal uh, misassignments. So again, RNA sequencing is tremendously powerful and we think uh, it has great potential for where we're trying to deploy state-of-the-art diagnostics in more resource-challenged environments. So to conclude, sequencing is revised molecular, molecular taxonomy. Transcriptomics are very important in integrating the, uh, the, the genomic lesions as well as being um, a very important um, approach to, to diagnose and classify the disease. And I've tried to give some examples of where both founding alterations as well as secondary alterations are important drivers of leukemogenesis, uh, drug response, uh, as well as uh, potential new therapeutic approaches. Now, i just finish with a last point, um, which is actually directly pertinent to work that we're doing with Alex's funding, and that is um, we have a long way to go with ILL. We, you know, many of our patients are driven by clonal aberrations of transcription factors, and we clearly need new approaches to drug or degrade these targets. And this is an active area of research uh, at the moment in ILL and, and similar diseases. And so there, I, I think many people, everything I've shown you today has been very collaborative from people in my lab from the team in protein degradation that I've shown you before, as well as many collaborators from CompBio um, and other groups and collaborators around the world. And so thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Charles. That was excellent.
Um, the questions are rolling in, so hopefully you have uh, a few minutes where you can answer some of these questions for us. Sure okay? thing. Okay. Um, the first question I'm going to give you is from Hendrick. Um, it says, with many genomic pathways available for ALL, is there any way to determine if one pathway is more important than others? Um, I, guess it, it, I guess it depends on how you define importance. I mean, I think um, purely the level of leukemogenesis, one might say that the pathways deregulating transcription factors are if not more important, as important as any others, because they are typically the ones that are most commonly seen as the founding initiating events, not always, there are always exceptions. They are typically maintained through disease evolution um, and important, again, as I touched on at the end, because they're the most difficult to drug. One might say then that chromatin pathways or kinase signaling alterations are less important. I mean, they're important in their own way. I mean, I guess one might say that they're less important because they're often more multiclonal at diagnosis. They can wax and wane through disease evolution, but they can often become just as important in their own right because they become real relapse and rich drivers during disease evolution, or even though they might be polyclonal or multiclonal at diagnosis, you get clonal convergence or collapse to a single clone where a single mutation becomes dominant. So, um, sorry, there's a lot to, to dissect in that question, but uh, that would be my first pass at answering it. Okay, the next question is interesting. Um, it comes from Julie. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, what priorities and needs would you like to see addressed to speed progress? How we often wonder, wish for a magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, th this is actually a really good question because and Jay is well aware of this, you know, every year ago we had a multi-day session where we thought, well, what, what, how do we answer this question? What are the things we really need? And I think we crystallized on a few different things. So we still, and none of these is more important than the others, but we need to better understand the treatment determinant, the determinants of treatment failure in cases that are classified as standard risk. So this is particularly true in ALL in contrast to other pediatric malignancies where it's often just the high risk cases that relapse. 50% of treatment failures in ALL come from standard risk cases and we don't yet know why. We need much better models and this is not an easy thing, but I think we're getting there. So part of that is that the disease is, is polygenic and we haven't had the right ways to model that. But now with better technical approaches, be it genome editing and with functional genomic approaches, we're making better inroads. We need to better understand the determinants of biology and treatment failure that aren't just simple or linear. Here's the genetic alteration of the tumor cell. It must be a driver. And again, we're getting better able to do that with some of the, the kind of like the broad-based functional gen genomic screens as well. And I would argue that we, we really do need a more systematic approach to develop new therapeutic approaches that are specifically focused on childhood cancer be they vulnerabilities from a logical, we say, well, this is a fusion like ZNF34 where we need a new treatment or from, you know, an output from a functional genomic approach. So that's going to be a pretty heavy wand to wield, but they would be a short list of things that I think are really important. Wow, that was a lot. So when you say models, do you mean mouse models? I, I mean both. I mean, I think so... Mouse models are part of it, but they're not everything, but they're, they're clearly very important because typically anything that we think is going to be therapeutically tractable is going to need to be validated in a mouse at some point, whether it's a genetically engineered mouse or whether it's from a xenograft. And again, I think we're getting better. So I think we've made the most progress on, on PDXs where there are now several repositories of increasingly well annotated human xenografts, but I think we do lag with the genetically engineered models. And I really think you need both because PDXs are, are typically best for testing therapies, but mm -hmm. the, the gems are still really important for precisely teasing out mechanism and, and manipulating specific genetic changes. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Yeah, sure. Okay, because there's a, a lot of them came in, so I just want to do a couple more. Um, Kaylin says there's significant disparity in ALL survival in racial ethnic minorities. And there's been a growing research on the role of genetics in addition to socio-cultural factors. What are your thoughts on the role of genetics on ALL survival and event-free survival in racial minorities? Um, it's very important and it's clearly part of the, 
the issue, um, but I don't think it's it's yet fully clear how important it is. And in fact, much of this work has really been done by other groups and not mine, but collaborators at St. Jude, like Mary Relling and Jun Yang and others, but they've made some really important seminal observations. So here's a very specific one. If you look at the entity I spoke about today, pH like ALL, a lot of it is CRLF2 rearranged. Um, very strongly enriched in a Hispanic in Hispanic populations, both in the US and in Central America. And part of that is through germline genomics. It's they, many of those cases have a germline polymorphism at a gene called GATA3, which we believe has a role in promoting the formation of the serial of two rearrangement. So there are some really strong and direct links between individual germline variants and disease phenotype. Um, but there are more subtle things. And you know, there's been a lot of work in this area using GWAS and other approaches showing that certain subtypes of leukemia are more enriched for various polymorphisms in certain ancestral backgrounds, be they um, African-Americans or Hispanics or others. And some of those variants are strongly associated with, uh, with relapse as well. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here that says, should we be, we be re researching leukemias, not by ALL versus AML, et cetera, but should we be researching leukemias as a whole focusing on the genomics, collecting, combining, and analyzing data across leukemias? Yes, we, sh we should and we are. And I didn't, didn't go into this today. I actually gave a talk on this at another conference a few weeks back that was more focused on mixed phenotype acute leukemia. And, you know, I touched on this with one example, but we've seen a very similar story in T myeloid leukemia where we've seen a lesion that transcends phenotype. And we've also seen that, yes, if you, if you do put everything into the same um, into the same mixing pot and at least at the transcriptome level and look at everything together, you can make some really striking additional observations. So for example, um, we can see that some lesions define particular new subgroups of mixed phenotype leukemia. And I showed one example of that today, but you can also see that there are other mixed phenotype leukemias that are the reverse, that they totally cluster with very conventional subtypes of ALL. And so they're more standard. They're just, for whatever reason, a PADR or telema one leukemia or some other leukemia that just happens to have, for, for some reason, lineage aberrancy that led it to be diagnosed as mixed phenotype leukemia but I would strongly argue that that case should be considered in the same basket as the conventional subtype of ALL. So um, a, lot, a lot of people are now doing this and um, both within St. Jude with our collaborators at the COG, it's taken a long time to do it both to amass all the data and it's still an ongoing process. Um, uh, we still have examples where we, we find something and it seems to make a point and we then scramble to pull in more data to confirm it, but it, there's a very strong rationale for doing this systematically. Yes. All right. I want to do one more, and I apologize to everyone whose question we did not get to. Um, this one comes from Adam DeSmith. And in the latest classification of BALL subtypes, there remains a proportion of patients with an unknown genomic classification, yes. even after whole genome and transcriptome sequencing. Do these tend to cluster together in T, SNE plots, or do you have any thoughts on what may underlie these leukemias? Yeah, this is a really great question, and and uh, I think we we are making progress, but we're still not quite there. If you kind of consider like we're reaching the asymptote. So, for example, you know, in one of the large analyses we've done recently, we did find a couple of new subgroups of TAL that were previously unclassified because we did have both the combination of RNA sequencing as well as whole genome sequencing to put them into a transcriptomic group and to identify the driver. I think. Um, I, I would think of it in terms of not just scale, but also and, and sequencing type, but also level of analysis where uh, we've often not fully reached the intersection of all of those three factors where we don't have enough cases, integrated RNA and whole genome sequencing, plus full analysis incorporating non-coding analysis as well. Um, and that, that has identified new subtypes. You know, I think um, we've debated this a long time over the years where we've said, well, there must be something non-genomic or there must be something epigenetic or similar. And I think, well, we've increasingly seen as we've resolved new subtypes that yes, there may be some perturbation that might target a pathway that for example is epigenetic, but typically there has been 
a genomic driver, be it a sequence change or a structural change that has led to classification of that entity. And it's my bias, I guess, from experience, but my feeling is that the vast majority of ALL cases with the right data set and analysis are going to be resolved as having a genomic basis, whether it's germline and or somatic. Well, thank you, Charles. Um, for the people that we didn't get to your questions, we'll see if Charles might be willing to answer them uh, offline. Um, but thank you so much for the talk today. It was really informative and I didn't read them out loud, but you got a lot of comments about how great the talk was. So oh, thank you very much. Again, I'm really glad to do it. I'm and so glad that Alex has uh, promoted this series. So thanks, Jay. Thanks to All the right. foundation. Thank we you. We appreciate everyone. it and take care. You're welcome. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.